HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Eli Sussman for Heritage Radio Network on tour. We're broadcasting live from the Le Creuset podcast studio at Charleston Wine and Food. Go to heritageradionetwork.org forward slash Charleston 2019 to see our full interview schedule. I'm here with Phil Rosenthal. Oh, boy. Hey, Phil. Hi, Eli. How's thanks it for, going? Thanks for being here. I like it. Uh, for, for those of you listening, uh, Phil is the creator and host of Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix, but he was also behind Everybody Loves Raymond, and he won the 2016 James Beard Award for Best Television Program. Phil, first and foremost, what have you eaten today? Wow. You see what my shirt says? <laughs> it says Lewis Barbecue. I ate all of Lewis Barbecue. They put, I put them out of business. It says picker on the back. Did you actually get into the pit? I did. I was in the pit. I helped none, but <laughs> I ate everything. Some. Yes, I ate almost everything they make, I think. It is the best barbecue I've ever had. It's phenomenal. And they, I've been to Franklin's. They have, they have a little booth here, and I just keep circling like a Do shark you? <laughs> and just weirdly Do coming back Do they say, back you've up. been around a few times, sir. They're like, Leave hey, man, some. go to the restaurant yeah. already, you know? Save some for someone else. Uh, but I, have you had better barbecue in your life? You know, it's, it's difficult to say. I got to shout out my literal hometown buddy, hometown BBQ, Billy Durney. It's Where's phenomenal that? in Red Hook. Uh, in Jersey? In, in New York. In yeah. Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, next time you're there, I'll take you down there, all right? That, I'll you tell think Billy that, that you're coming. Is better than what I just had at Lewis or Franklin's in Austin? Or I haven't been to Franklin, so I can't speak to that. Yeah. Lewis is incredible. It's really yeah. hard to pick a favorite, but man, they is got it this like smoke, pizza. They got this smoked turkey at hometown, yes. and like I dream about it. Wow. Um, the turkey at Lewis, surprisingly, it's not something you think about. I mean, turkey, smoked turkey in general. Do you know yeah. at Franklin's in Austin, it's the first thing that yeah. sells out. Is really? The turkey. Oh, I did not know but, that. But but. I don't know how much is Aaron Franklin and how much is John Lewis because they started it together yeah. out of a trailer. He told me the whole story this morning. I was shocked. I had I didn't know. I, the people said, oh, Lewis is very good barbecue. I had no idea his history. Yeah. He started Franklin Barbecue with Aaron and then La Barbecue, which I also loved and I didn't know was him. And now we come here to Charleston. What a great surprise this was for me. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask about your your TV show and... Whether or not it's actually as glamorous as people might think it is. Like, people think yeah. you just travel around and eat. And eat, yeah. But, but, can't but it's, possibly it's, it's hard, though, right? Can you talk about what the day-to-day is and the preparation that goes into it? I don't want to ruin your whole thing here, but it's, it's a dream. <laughs> it's friggin' great. I'll tell you what stinks. The waiting to do it again. <laughs> That's what stinks. So, show business, right? In the, in the phrase show business, the word business is the part that gets in the way of making the show part of show business. And that's the hardest part. Waiting for them to pick you up. Waiting to get approval to go. Waiting to... Waiting. There's that song. Right? That's the hardest part. Going and doing it is an absolute joy. Yes, we work very hard, but I think it was Mark Twain who said, make your vacation your vocation. And that's what we've done. And I do it with my brother, who was a producer anyway. And when I first got the gig at PBS, 
I call him up and I go, I got this show. Uh, he goes, what is it? I said, uh, I'm going to try to get people to travel by showing them the best places in the world to eat. And he goes, really, that's your show? <laughs> yes. What are you going to call it? The lucky bastard? <laughs> And I said, quit your job. He was a producer for, I think he was doing Facebook original videos. Quit your job and we'll call our production company Lucky Bastards. And so I get to go around the world with my best friend, my, my, my little brother, and, and we make this show. And, you know, my son was a PA on it. When my wife and daughter have some vacation time, they join us on the road when we do it. I have ZPZ, the production company that... that did Mr. Bourdain shows, mm -hmm. so they have fixers all over the world. They send us lots and lots of material to, to look through and figure out where we want to go. I can do, as everyone can, research on my phone or laptop, seeing where, you know, it's easy to research where you want to eat, where it's going to be a fun experience, what's going to fit with my personality, and where it's going to be out of my comfort zone a little bit so that I can take one step out of the comfort zone. Obviously, just like choosing a, a barbecue spot as your favorite, which yeah. is a difficult question, yeah. I want to ask what cities have just totally floored you? Where so have you gone that just... The big surprises of this last uh, dozen, let's say, were Lisbon. You been? I have, I have not been. I lived in Spain for a while and never made it all the way over there. But I know. It's like uh, people think of Portugal as the New Jersey of Spain. Right. Right? But it's not. It's just as phenomenal. It, I think Lisbon is as great a world city as I've ever been to. I've only heard good things about it from I think everybody. of all the shows we've done, I get the most response from people that they went to Lisbon because of our show, and they loved, loved, loved it. I've been back already since we filmed. I've made friends there. It, it's laid out like San Francisco a little bit with the hills. It's even got something that looks like the Golden Gate bridge it's even got the cable cars going up the hills and then it's got the piazzas of italy and the cafes and pastries of paris it's it and its own great seafood culture the, uh what's the um egg custard pastry that they do pastiche. there yeah pastel de nata if you're having one pastiche if you're having more than one which is what i did <laughs> i can't recommend it enough so there was one and the other was copenhagen you've been there I also have not been there. Come on, man! Unfortunately not. If Let's only go. someone would fly I'm us around. I'm ready and we right could now. So go. Copenhagen, like the cleanest air, food, and water I've ever seen or experienced. Every bite of food there from the hot dog on the cart to Noma. Uh, it's Seems terrific. like Copenhagen really has it figured out, right? They have everything yes. dialed in. Transportation, cleanliness. It. So let's say social here, services. If we give half our money to taxes, right? We don't feel like we get very much for it. There it's a hard, half your money goes to taxes, right? But what do you get? Uh, education through college, free. You get uh, universal health care, free, right? You get the cleanest air, food, and water. Like uh, the river in the middle of the city, which would be, let's say, the equivalent of the Hudson River, boats are going by, but there's decks built out onto the water where people are sunning themselves and circular slides where children are going into that water. <laughs> and then they're not... eating the mussels and shellfish yeah. out of the water. Why can't we no have that? No one's diving into the Hudson River and enjoying it. Not yet. <laughs> but maybe someday. Hopefully. What if we learn something? What's I, wrong with that? I would, I would hope that we could take a lot of cues from their city. and. Well, that's why I do the show. Because I think the world would be a little better if we were open a tiny bit to other people's experiences. Two-thirds of us don't have a passport in America, right? Not to say that things are terrible today, but maybe we would be doing a little better if we just expanded our minds a drop. And nothing does that better for you than travel. For you, when you're traveling and you're doing the show... You go to both high-end restaurants yes. and also eat street food and everything in between. Just like you would do on a vacation. You have the one splurge, right, that you go, well, I'm here. I got to go to the big thing. And then the rest of the time, you're just, sometimes it's just a baguette and cheese and you're sitting in the park and that's as great as anything. I don't know if it's different in your personal life than it is in the show, but is there one that, that you prefer more? Do you love that splurge meal or do you do it more for the show? That's a great question. Some splurges are better than others, right? Some splurges make you feel 
like you're having that vacation without the three or four hour drudgery which it can become. If the food isn't, you know, mind-blowing fireworks, right? Like a, a, a great one, a great splurge is Gagan in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. You get a menu, it's all emojis. So right away it's funny and fun and everything is going to be that emoji and he's so playful and so creative and then the food is so delicious you don't even feel the time go by that's the kind of splurge you want as opposed to the very stiff old school french sit white tablecloth it's going to be a long time yeah. and if you don't like that giant piece of fish in cream sauce you're not having that much fun. Yeah, and the painful silences in between courses and the pageantry. That and can the wine pairing. Get exhausting. And that, can, that alone can be. You know, listen, I'm very, very lucky because I've gotten to do this. By the way, I used to save up for this when I was in my 20s in New York City, and all I could afford was tuna fish or pizza or a hot dog for dinner. And once a year on my birthday, I would save up to go to one of these places. Le Grand Wee, Le Tess, Le, Le Bernardin. These are phenomenal places. It's just that... I know people who, when they go on vacation, they want one of those every night. I, it kills you. Yeah. Can't do it. Give me the hot dog. Seriously, yeah. Give me the burger. Give me the great street bite that Give has a Give me the pizza. Give me the falafel. The 30 person line of you locals, got it. right? You got it. People ask me, you're in Bangkok, weren't you scared? Don't you get sick from the street food? I'm like, you see the line? If they were poisoning people, the line wouldn't be as long. Seems very simple. Right? Yeah. That's what I think. By the way, in my travels, in the 18 episodes that we've done for both PBS and now Netflix, I didn't get food poisoning once. I haven't gotten sick once. I went back to L.A. the week after we shot. I had a sprout that wasn't washed properly. You didn't see me for three days. Well, and P.S., that also happens in America all the time from produce that people get sick from. And yes. they don't. You know, the enemy is the baby sprout. You know that, yes. right? Because <laughs> if they wash it, it wilts and it doesn't look nice. Right. So you get a dirty sprout that's Instagrammable and you're on the toilet. <laughs> you're a New York guy, but you make your life in L.A.? Now, now I do for the last 30 years, yeah. Where did you grow up in New York? I was born in Queens, like our president. And I lived in Riverdale in the Bronx till I was nine, and then Rockland County for most of my childhood through high school, and then Hofstra University, and then into Manhattan for 10 years. What do you miss a lot, if anything, about Manhattan, or are you you're, you're over most, it? No, New York is the most exciting place on earth, I think, so far. It's, it seems like the center of the universe to me, uh, and to many people. I go there at least once every two months, if not once a month. My parents are still there. My brother and his family are still there. Many, many friends still there. I love it. But now, as I get old, <laughs> I enjoy the California lifestyle more and more. I enjoy the weather. It's very nice always. I, the restaurant scene maybe now even, don't fight me, even better than New York? I completely agree. You do? I do. And you're a New Yorker. Uh, I used to live in Los Angeles, so maybe slightly biased, but yes. I think that LA is more interesting and exciting at every price point. The diversity? Yes. I mean, even more than New York. I know that people can't believe it. You think New York is the most diverse place on earth, but now it's LA. Yeah, I mean, especially for Manhattan, I feel like you, know, you have to go outside of Manhattan to find some of those other price points and things. Because that people you can can't afford LA. to live in Manhattan it's true. anymore. That's true. <laughs> yeah, the, it, you know, if you have. You need a $100,000 job to just have a tiny apartment in, in Manhattan. Yeah, and, you know, you need a lot more than that to hit a lot of these restaurants of that course. are popping up in New York that are. $280 before wine pairings and it. most normal people don't get to eat that way. That's right. I think LA is a lot more egalitarian in its ability to provide unique food at all different And there's something points. else. If you notice in New York, every restaurant is packed whether it's good or not because you don't have a car. When you have a car, it gives you a little freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom of choice. You're going to drive that extra 10 minutes to go to the place you want to go to. I want to jump back to before yeah. you started the food show yeah. and you were in the show business. The show business, yes. Uh, how did you get started? How did it come to be? The food show. The, the, or show business. Yeah. like Oh, goodness. What, what was your entry point into... Uh, I would say watching The Honeymooners when I was a kid and, and watching the great sitcoms and comedy shows that were available you know, on our black and white uh, TV in the 60s. Uh, I loved Jackie Gleason. I loved Art Carney. I loved... 
Dick Van Dyke and All My Family and, and Mary Tyler Moore and Taxi and The Odd Couple. These were just things. And my, my parents are funny. My dad is very funny. Uh, and that was just the currency of the house. You know, were you a made performer? Jokes. Well, I was because when you're a kid, you don't know that there's writing and directing and producing. You just watch the show you like and you go, I want to be them. Sure. So I just wanted to be funny. I didn't understand what that meant. I just wanted to be funny and make people laugh. So the only legal way to do that in school and not get thrown out of school is to be in the school plays, right? So that's what I did. And then people, you know, gave me the worst thing you can get, which is approval. And then I majored in that theater at Hofstra on Long Island. And at Hofstra, they made you take these courses in playwriting, play analysis, directing, putting on shows, things like this, all stuff I knew I would never use, right? I, I, my joke is they made me take these courses I knew I would never use, like English. And, and so I didn't know it then, but all of that would come in really handy when I became a writer and then a showrunner, you know? Uh, Raymond, in, in running Raymond, I utilized everything I learned at Hofstra University. Really. It's just on a different scale, that's all. Do you remember the first laugh that you heard that was from one of your jokes where you were watching the show and you said, I wrote that and you heard somebody crack up about it? You mean Raymond? Yeah. Well, by that time, I'd already been a writer for other shows for about five years. And I do remember, by the way, the first job I got on a sitcom was the Robert Mitchum sitcom in 1989 when I first got to Hollywood. Yeah, I see your blank stares. Yes, that's the appropriate response. Uh, Sorry, not sure who that is. Oh, you don't know who... Yeah, because you're too young. But he was a great... You know what film noir is? Yeah. He was one of the great actors of film noir, Robert Mitchum. You can look him up. I recommend his movies. He's unbelievably great. What you don't think of him as is a sitcom actor, and he didn't think of himself that way either, but he took the gig because he liked the money, I think. And that... Uh, it's hilarious, but that was my first job when I got to town. And I remember very clearly him saying something that made the small audience that we have laugh, and it was a thrill. I later wrote jokes for the President of the United States at the time, uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and I heard Bill Clinton get a laugh with one of my lines, and that was a huge thrill. So were you basically, did you punch up speeches? Yes. With, and when, what types of speeches? All well, of them or when he gave? No, there's, okay. a, there's actually a humor season in Washington. I know we think it's year round now, but uh, April and May is the gridiron dinner, the radio and TV correspondence dinner, and the big one, the White House correspondence, correspondence dinner. Mm-hmm. And every year I was called upon through my friend Mark Katz, who worked as uh, kind of a humor punch-up guy for Clinton in Washington. He would call me when they needed some additional help. And I would get jokes in, and sometimes I would, you know, they were having trouble with a line, like the president was having, he didn't understand how to deliver a line, and I would kind of direct the president through them, and then see it be on my TV. And, And that was thrilling. And then I had this idea to do a video, and they said, for the correspondence dinner, and they said, well, the president doesn't have time to make a video until his last year. And then we made one, and I went to the White House, I co-wrote it with two of my friends, Mark Katz, who worked there, and Jeff Schessel, and I got to direct the president of the United States in a video. And it doesn't seem like anything phenomenal now because... No, it's phenomenal. Yeah, That's amazing. It seems pretty incredible, <laughs> well, honestly. I mean, because <laughs> Obama did a lot of, like, between two ferns, and he did this right. kind of yeah. thing. But no one had ever done, no sitting president had ever done a legit, like, Saturday Night Live type of comedy video while in the White House. So I actually got run of the White House with the president of the United States. unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And that thing, you know, just, it's called The Final Days, if you want to check it out on YouTube. Before social media and video sharing and everything, too. Before all that. Now everybody's doing that type of stuff. Exactly, right. But, I mean, when this thing hit in the room... right. It was like Sonic, and the next day the Today Show led with that video because it was the first case of a sitting president doing this. It was amazing. I want to ask about success. Yes. And you, you, have, you have had a lot. Can and I tell you my favorite definition of the word success? Yes. It's from Bob Weir of The Grateful Dead. 
They asked him, how has it changed you? He said, you know those pistachio nuts that don't have the little crack in them to get you started? I don't bother with those anymore. I love it. Is that the greatest? I love it. So on, you're a fan. So many, oh, yeah. On so many Had levels. you heard him say that? I've never heard that. How great actually. is that quote? That's awesome. That's everything, right? As you go into the third season or the fourth, third season has been filmed completely. I've done nothing. I'm waiting. This is now the hard part. I'm waiting to see where and when it's going to happen. It's a different world. When might that be? I don't know. you got to call Netflix and say, let's go, people. <laughs> What's the number? Let's tell everybody to Seriously, call them because I'm waiting it, too. Let's get it going <laughs> for you. another season. <laughs> Thank you. You're down here in Charleston. Love it. First time. First time. Yeah. Uh, Do you live here? No. I oh. live in Brooklyn. Right. Uh, I'm curious... This well, isn't your first time, is it? No, I came last year with Heritage. So yeah. uh, I've been around. This is your city. Do, uh, I've been here all, almost six years. Yeah. And, and so, love it. love it. I can see why. It's and, fantastic. But, um, uh, but people are telling me the summer is brutal. It's brutal. I mean, it's hot and humid like you wouldn't understand. But, you know. <laughs> As we sit in a 90-degree room exactly. right now sweating. No, but, this you know, is We don't, this have, is to shovel, we don't yeah. have to shovel snow. Right. I mean, it's trade-offs. But it's humid, too. You could feel it almost. Oh, uh, yeah, even in the winter, you, I mean, you feel it. Oh, yeah. So where do you escape to? Uh, we're five minutes from the beach, so okay. you can go there. Just hop in the water, right? Yeah, hop in the water. Yeah. I mean, we've got family in New York, so we get up there. So, but, you know, you just... By the way, New York in August is no treat either. Brutal, well, definitely yeah. in the city, for sure. What's, yeah. So what is your take on Charleston that you're here? You've been to so many cities. You've eaten so many different places. What so is it, what, so what I've been to New to Orleans. I've been to New Orleans a bunch of times, and I'm in love with the architecture, and some of that's uh, uh, echoed here. And, and you have your own history. But there's a sweetness to the people. It's very laid back. It's very, very beautiful. And maybe because I'm here on this weekend, but I don't think so, it seems like the food is extraordinary, Right. And, Absolutely, and I love no anything doubt. with a great food scene. But I also see the culture. I see a lot of museums, and I see a lot of music happening. Every place is defined by the people, and the layout, and the parks. I think are essential. The hospitality here yes. and the camaraderie is really wonderful. Yes. that's what's struck Everybody me. Everybody smiles. You know, yeah. if you if you are a New Yorker, you're used to walking down the street and people averting your gaze. Totally. Here, they meet your eyes and give you a smile. They're happy I to, can't tell you. They're what happy that to brag does. about their little secret. They're like, "Yeah, we live in Charleston year round. You, uh, you yes. figured out why it's so wonderful." Right. So I could see coming here a lot more. Since I'm in New York and you're an old New York guy yeah. from yeah. back in the day, yeah. when you go back to visit family, yes, is there one spot that you always have to check out? There's pizza. You know, the, there's still New York pizza, which and you is I have to grab a slice somewhere. Always. The, there's not a, a visit, even if I'm there for a day, where I'm not grabbing that. I love it. Specific. And I did a New, New York place episode. every time. I did a New York episode where I highlighted three places. One was Totonos, one was Tafara, and one is this kind of new school. Raza in Jersey City, which counts because it's seven minutes on the path train. <laughs> I think if you can get somewhere in half an hour from Midtown, it counts, counts, right? So that's great. I just discovered Mama's 2. You know about Mama's 2? I saw the review about it, 106 yeah. in Broadway. Seems like people are real pumped about it. I Frank haven't tried it yet. Frank is awesome. I just came right before this. I was at the Pizza Expo in Las Vegas. And he was there. A bunch of people. Raza's was there. People from Rome were there. I recommend that if you're a pizza guy. In Very the convention cool. center there? Yeah. I've been to a convention for a catering service convention while that was going on. Yes. It was, I mean, I walked through. It's amazing. 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 And everyone's making Totally pizza. nuts. Just pizza slices everywhere. You got it. <laughs> and the new hottest ovens and flowers. Yeah, that's a dream. Phil, I want to thank you for taking some time to sit down with us here. My pleasure. It was awesome to hear about some of your travels <laughs> and uh, and a little bit about uh, and your career. And uh, I think the Bill Clinton thing is just unbelievable. <laughs> Very, that must have been a real surreal moment it for was. you. It uh, was. Everybody, thanks for listening. We've got more amazing Heritage Radio content coming up next. Thank you to La Crusade and the Julia Child Foundation for making Heritage Radio Network on tour at Charleston Wine and Food Possible. I'm Eli Sussman for Heritage Radio Network. HRN is a member-supported nonprofit based in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Listen to over 10,000 episodes of Food Radio Podcasts and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org. Thanks.
Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.